computer. Here we go. And I'd like to introduce to everyone, Greg Kilstrom. So Greg is, uh, has several companies. He's been in the business for a long time, uh, especially on the side of HR, if I'm correct on that, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but he's, uh, he's running a group called GK5A, and he also has a podcast, a very popular podcast. So I'll, I'll let him tell you about that. But this title of this workshop is The Business Value of CX, Creating Meaningful Measurements. So Greg, I'll let you take it from here. Great, great. Well, no, thanks so, thanks so much for having me. And I know this is the last uh, workshop of the day, but I'll try to make it a, um, a, a valuable one. So um, let's see. So we've got uh, we've, what I'd love to do is make this uh, interactive, you know, to I, I've got some slides. I'm going to share my screen in a second, but, you know, I'd love to um, first uh, maybe just use the use the chat feature since there are a, a number of us, uh, you know, I'd love to go around the, the room, so to speak, but might might take up a, a bit of time here. But if everybody in the in the chat window, if you could just um, give me an idea of um, just what your what your role is within the organization um, that you're in, you know, kind of just help me because um, there's there's a wide range of of kind of approaches we can take here. <laughs> we got one big cheese here, so. <laughs> but yeah, I just love to see you know if you're solely responsible for you know if CX is you know is is what you're a hundred percent focused on or if you're in marketing or, you know, some related field or, or anything like that, if you, if you want to just put that in the chat window, that'd be great. Um, but so what, I, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, what I think a lot of people run into, which is, you know, I think everybody understands the, the, the value of, of customer experience in that, um, happy customers buy more, they buy more often and, and so on and so forth. But oftentimes justifying investments in CX can be somehow sometimes difficult. So, you know, we need to drive that um, back to providing, not only providing business value, but justifying the business value that the customer experience translates into. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, I think you should be able to see the, the slide there. Um, just make sure I have the chat window here as well. And thanks everybody for sharing your your roles and, and everything with me. That's 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 great. Um, so yeah, so just really really briefly about me. Um, Mark already did an intro here. Um, I I run a consulting firm called GK Five A. Also, I've, I've written a few books. The most recent one is where a lot of the thoughts I'm going to share is, are taken from. It's called Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience. Um, the foreword was actually written by Greg Melia of CXPA. So, um, you know, has, has that connection for those of you that are also involved in, in CXPA. I have a podcast called The Agile Brand. And I do have a background in, I've worked a lot on the HR and, and employee experience side. I also have a, mar a marketing background as well. So I ran a ran and sold a marketing agency several years ago um, before really focusing a lot a lot more deeply on on the customer experience side of things. So um, first, what I want to do is I think everybody here understands what customer experience is, but I think it's really important that we actually have a common definition of that that, that we can all share in a common vocabulary. And so, I like to always start there with just uh, you know just creating that that common vocabulary. So you know a few ways to approach this. I think first is to remind ourselves that we are here for the customer. You know, customers don't um, look don't wake up in the morning and think about what brands they want to engage with. Right? They uh, they have problems to solve. They have challenges they want to overcome. They have things that they want to do. And so you know they're busy. Oftentimes, it's it's about solving a practical problem. It's not always solely about customer delight. Um, it's sometimes it's really just about you know I need to buy a product as quickly and easily as possible and have that show up at my house and and so on and so forth. And so, you know, that, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is this marketing funnel. Anybody that's been in a marketing or, or sales course or done sales or marketing, you've seen this. 
you know, in, in reality, it looks a lot more like this, right? It's that, that sales funnel is not a linear process anymore. People are switching, they're switching channels, they're switching devices. They're asking their friends, they're asking people they don't even know online for, for advice, uh, looking at reviews and, and so on and so forth. And so that customer journey, it becomes more and more important that brands are able to differentiate themselves, not just by a product and service standpoint, but also from an experience standpoint. And so, you know, customer experience isn't just one of these things. Customer experience includes usability, customer service, customer satisfaction, net promoter score, and many, many other things. But at the end of the day, customer experience is the overall uh, perception by a consumer of, of the brand. So, you know, from the very first moment, to the moment they decide to buy or buy again, or the moment they decide to quit buying from the company, so that it is that holistic journey that we're that we're talking about, and so that that probably gels with your preconceived ideas coming into this as well. But again, just want to want to reiterate that that we're really talking about that holistic customer experience. So customer experience measurement is so important um, for uh, several reasons. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a few here, and uh, you know I touched on this already, but you know one is justifying. Sorry for the text being cut off a little bit here. One is justifying the cost of the effort that we put into customer experience. You know some of you I see here are um, directly related with CX. Um, some of you have some some relationship to customer experience in your roles. So, um, but I think everybody here has at the very least an interest, if not a direct relationship to CX. Um, what company is going to say that they don't love their customers, right? You know, I think that's a very easy thing for, for companies to be able to say is that yes, the customer is number one, we treat our customers well, so on and so forth. What really, you know, what really matters though, is where do they put their time? Where do they put their money? What do they emphasize? What's the kind of culture that they emphasize within the organization? Is it one of customer centricity or is it one of getting a dollar, getting a quick return, regardless of the customer experience or the long-term implications of those customer relationships? And so measuring customer experience allows us to help and put numbers behind, um, investments in customer experience, whether that's, uh, you know, dollars, time, or all of the above. A quote I'm sure many of you have seen before as well, you know, what gets measured gets, um, gets, gets, what, yeah, what gets measured gets managed. And so um, I thought I had my M words confused there, but not, not so. Um, <laughs> so uh, Measuring means that we are staying on top of these things. We're not just, uh, you know, we're not just saying, oh, we had a good quarter or we had so we had go some good repeat buyers there. Uh, you know, instead, it's it allows us to put in place systems and processes and allows us to reinforce that these are really important things. Um, you know, I, I like this quote here, you know, if we don't take care of our customers, someone else will, you know, simply saying you care about your customers isn't enough, as I, as I was saying um, just, just then. You got to create a plan. Um, you have to measure, analyze, and importantly, and I'll get to this later on, find ways to improve the customer experience. It's not just enough to have systems in place. It's not just enough to measure NPS and understand that it goes up up and down and so on and so forth. Uh, we have to have systems and processes and a culture that is based on continuous improvement. So another thing to keep in mind when measuring is the idea of customer experience maturity. And so this is something where I've, I've put a fair amount of, of work and effort into myself and, and included a, a, a maturity scale as part of my book as well. And so to keep in mind, every organization is at a different maturity stage and every industry is as well. And so you may be in the same industry, but your company is either way ahead or, or maybe it's, it's lagging behind. What you will see is the number one and two in each industry vertical Generally speaking, they have a strong focus on customers and and that is I'm sure you've seen statistics, but you know as as companies are 
defining and measuring their priorities, customer experience is becoming more and more of a priority. And for those leaders in their markets, uh, many of them we can name, you know, name in the verticals, the ones that really stand out are the ones that do put their customers first. But you've got to start where you are. You can't start and say, hey, we want to be number one in our category if you're, you know, number 10, right? So we need to find ways to not only understand where we want to get to, but also where we currently are so we can map from here to there. And so what I do with, with organizations I work with is, is using the scale, um, really try to map again where, where an organization currently is. And I'll just kind of walk through quickly uh, how, how these are defined. So um, the first stage, and, and the, they're named based on the relationship that customer experience has to the, the organization. And so in stage number one, the analyze stage, uh, organizations are really, they're trying to figure out, okay, what, what does it look like for us to massively improve our customer experience and to make a concerted effort to do that? So they're, it's about analysis. It's about trying to figure out, let's, let's figure out what the requirements are really not only where we are currently, but, um, you know, but where, where we could reasonably get to, where are some of our shortcomings and things like that, but not a lot of action, right? It's, it's more about, uh, coming to an understanding. At the second stage experiment, um, as the name would suggest, there are some proofs of concepts, some pilot projects, some things like that happening. So there's experimentation, but there are not necessarily uh, fully formed systems, departments, committees, um, centers of excellence, all of those things. Those are not in place at this point. There's really just some, we're testing the waters and, and trying to learn what works and learn a little bit more about our customers and, and so on and so forth. Next stage, influence. This is where those, those experiments are starting to pay off. And so we're starting to see some ROI on them in a small degree, admittedly, but you know, we're starting to see some, some influence on the bottom line, some influence on the culture of the organization, some influence on customer purchase and repeat purchase behavior. And so you know, we're starting, the, the, the scales are starting to tip, in other words, at this point. Um, at the next stage, there is real impact on the organization. Uh, investments are not only um, paying off, but they're consistent in nature. There are, um, whether they're steering committees or working groups across cross disciplinary across the organization, um, there's a department that is that is responsible and, and, and accountable for these things, and there are longstanding programs in place. And then the final stage is this transform stage where customer experience, it's not an afterthought. It is driving innovation and driving true change within the organization. And again, I, I think we could probably name a few organizations um, that, that do this because they come up a lot and they're used often as examples, um, within their, within their categories, you know, the, the Southwest airlines and the Chick-fil-A's and, and all those of the world, American express, you know, all those companies that really are leaders in their categories. And there's countless stories about how they relate to their customers and how they make customer experience, just part of the, the organization's DNA. So for those of you that, um, are not a five um, here, maybe this slide will make you feel a little bit better. So based on some, some analysis done a couple of years ago, um, you'll see while there are, um, you know, about 30% of organizations fall in that either four or five category, there are, we've got 70% of all organizations really a one to a three. Um, and so these numbers are a couple of years old. So I would imagine that there are going to be more mature organizations at this point, but still there's a lot of room to move. Um, and so, um, you know, something, something to take note of, but again, category leaders, they're, they're falling in this category and the gap, um, you know, the, the chasm between a five and a one is becoming harder and harder to overcome. Um, just a, a question for for people, and, and please you know speak up if you if you have an example. Have any of you ever done an exercise like this, or um, or anything like that, or just you know if anybody has any questions, I'll just kind of pause here. Uh, 
Hey, Greg, this is David. <clears throat> I've uh, certainly compared uh, my program against the Forster maturity assessment. It's been a while, but um, yeah, I did it a couple of years ago. Was it, did, was it, did you find it a useful exercise? Um, yeah, I guess oh, I thought what was interesting is my, uh, the results of my program, let's call it, let's just go with NPS, kind of really mimicked the, the, the progress, you know, three, uh, you know, I go three years, barely move, and then I go up, and then, you know, a year or two, then I'm flattened for a little bit, a little, little improvement, a little improvement, and then I go up, you know, there's this effect that every four years, it seems like I make, I make it to the next level, and I think Forrester had something like that, and we kind of mapped across that, it's not a cycle, but that trend um, pretty well, so I, did it help me? Well, all I, used it for was just a kind of flyby slide for onboarding training just to make new employees feel that hey there's something serious around here about cx you know our strategy our program and it maps to forester and we're making progress so that was only reason only use of that tool or that slide <clears throat> yeah no thanks thanks for sharing um anybody else um have a have any thoughts on that Uh, well, yeah, we can. Well, I was just going to say we are doing something right now with CXPA regional basis. Um, I'm on the regional council, and right now we're dealing with this whole experience maturity uh, assessment as a national, like how does the U.S. do, right? And how, and, and so we're looking at it, saying really there's, and you've got it really nice here, but it, it depends on how mature the company is, not necessarily a region. And there's some companies that are on their game, and a lot of the smaller companies are just getting into it. And so we're working on this right now. I'd love to chat with you about it later <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I've, I've run, I've, I have an assessment that I use and that I've run with a number of organizations as well as I've done a combination of customer experience and employee experience as well, which is also fascinating to see. Uh, I mean, I, I believe that you can't truly have great customer experience without Good employee experience. You can you can do it for a little bit. You can do CX good for for a little bit, but um, it really takes it takes an investment in both to to do it well. And so yeah, I've I've done some maturity assessments there. It's it's been pretty interesting. Okay, well, cool. I'll I'll move on here. Um, so what I want to talk about here. Um, next, next thing is just to talk about measuring ROI throughout the customer journey. And so I'll I'll get to NPS and some of the, the benefits as well as some of the shortcomings in a, in a minute, but just to kind of spoil that a little bit here, um, it's really important that we do measure throughout the journey because you know, if we only measure at one stage or with one, you know, uh, one type of question at one specific point, it becomes difficult to diagnose where there may be either opportunities or shortcomings um, to address. And so, you know, everybody has a different set, uh, a different journey map or, you know, namings of, of steps in the journey, but I use this one. Sometimes there's five steps. The names are always different, so on and so forth. But, you know, generally speaking, what we're talking about is, you know, we're going from, you know, this is the acquisition stage to making the sale to ultimately engaging them and ideally forming this infinite loop here of we've got customers that are buying and then they're they're becoming evangelists and then they're repeat buying and and using word of mouth to to drive others as well to the um into the fold so understanding this and you know i'm sure many of you have if you're in cx and, and done things you've done journey mapping exercises filled out what people are doing at each stage in the process so um, I'm not going to teach everybody what what journey mapping is um, in in this workshop, but you know, uh, suffice to say that doing it, I have never done it and not learned something. No matter how much I knew about the the company, the product, the service, whatever, I I have never done journey mapping without 
coming away with at least a few real important insights that I didn't have going into that. So it teaches you empathy with the customer because you're trying to walk through um, things in their shoes, but it also teaches you empathy with the people behind the scenes doing the work. And I think that's that's something that is sometimes overlooked is the people and the processes that actually go into doing these things. Um, a lot of times we think of software as running a lot of things and, and even software and platforms as the complicated part of, of whether it's a, a change initiative or even just keeping things running smoothly. But oftentimes it's the people and the processes that they use that that can be, um, you know, a lot of workarounds being used, a lot of people that are disgruntled or, or things like that, that um, can be easily or relatively easily solved. And so, you know, going through this process, really understanding what is the customer seeing, what are the teams that are delivering that experience doing, how do they have to work with each other, whether it's, you know, person to person or person to platform to person or, or whatever combination, understanding all of that you know is be, becomes an incredibly um, important process and it does make measurement easier when we actually go through and understand how systems and processes relate to one another we're able to really see okay yes there's a gap here we're not on top of it already um let's uh you know let, let's let's fill that gap so to speak and so, you know, just to just to briefly go through here um, the the stages in the journey as as I've outlined it, um, just go through here. So this this initial this initial phase, this education phase, you know, this is, the important thing to note here is we've got a lot of customers at this stage that don't even really understand the solutions to their problems, and so. Um, from my marketing days as well, this this comes in handy or sales or, or and, and CX as well is we need to be helping people to understand what their challenges are, not just trying to sell them stuff, right? So um, whatever whatever our relationship is to them at this at this stage, whether we're you know marketing CX sales um, technical support whatever, you know it is about understanding you know how can we educate them on the on the process. So, you know, be helpful, not salesy. Um, the metrics that we want to use are, you know, how much content, educational content is someone consuming and, you know, how helpful do they find that content? If they don't find it helpful um, on our on our platforms, they're going to go somewhere else and chances are they're going to see um, some other products or services or companies named in that um, you know, in, in their research. And so well, let's, let's be as helpful as we possibly can to do that. And so measuring measurements at that stage would be, you know, how helpful are they finding our, our materials? Um, and so, you know, and things like search behavior on your site or, you know, sales funnel behaviors, a lot of times your, your measurements here are going to overlap with, with marketing and sales, for instance. Um, as we go to the next stage, consideration, this is where they're educated. They know, they know the problem that they have. They understand what the solution is to their problem, but now they're considering whether it's your product or service they're going to solve versus, versus theirs. And so, you know, measurements are often um, similar to, um, you know, to the, the education, you know, measurement types are similar. Um, but, you know, if you're a, if you're a, B2B company getting a little deeper into product service demos and, and follow-ups like that, questions and comments posted and, and things like that would, would be ways to, uh, to measure customer experience there. As we go through purchase, you know, there's some obvious ways to measure this, of course, you know, did, did we make the sale or not? But again, if you're in B2B with a long sales cycle, even B2C with a long sales cycle, there's some, there's some things that uh, that you want to look at is, you know, not only how long is that process and is it longer with some customers than others, but what are the immediate actions after the purchase, right? So are they immediately on the phone asking for tech support, in which case we didn't educate that customer well enough during the process? Did they make the right purchase? Do they want to, I mean, God forbid they want to return the product, but, you know, even if they just have a lot of questions about it because they didn't really know what they were buying, there's some room to move there on, on, on customer experience. And then of course, there's the post-sales surveys and, and questionnaires as well, the NPS questions, things like that, that, that we wanna be able to ask them. And then, you know, the last stage in this, in this journey is the, the activation. And this, this is the stage really, I feel 
it, it's becoming more and more important. And I, I know that companies are paying more and more attention to it. It's why, you know, those that have, have had customer loyalty programs for years and, and in some cases decades now have known this already, of course, but we're seeing a lot more emphasis on this, this activation and engagement and building evangelists than we ever have, even with, with organizations that have not primarily been key, you know, candidates for a customer loyalty program. And so, um, you know, this is our chance to really build that repeat behavior. Uh, anybody in sales knows it's a lot, um, you know, it's a lot easier to retain a current customer than it is to win a new one, right? So, um, you know, anything we can do to, um, to maintain that, that great customer experience um, during that activation phase. So, you know, help, help customers use their product better, provide flexible methods of communication. As we saw in that sales funnel slide, customers are all over the map as far as what devices or platforms they may use. And they're, they're not only gonna use the one that you think they should use or want them to use, they're gonna use whatever's in front of them. They're gonna tweet at you when they have a problem sometimes and they'll use live chat another day. They're, they're really, they're gonna use whatever's in front of them to, um, to do that. And you need to, need to be able to respond and, and provide the right um, you know, rewards and incentives when people take uh, the right behaviors as well. So um, now I want to go through the, the metrics of, of customer experience. And I think um, uh, some of what I'm going to share, um, many of you have seen and been working with for, um, for years now, I'm sure. Uh, what I've done in, in my book, um, as well as what, I, what I've done with several clients that I've worked with, is really split this up into four categories of, of measurement. Um, and I think some of them, like I said, are you've you've known you've been using. Some of them are a little less used than than others. And so I want to kind of walk through in this way. And so there's there's two dimensions. There's the external customer facing dimension. And there's, there's the internal and, and inward um, company facing dimension. And so just kind of go through these um, one by one here. So. Um, Qualitative, I'm sure many, if not most of you know what this means, but things that are subjectively measured, um, whether it's, you know, do you like the product? How likely are you to recommend that, you know, that, that NPS question? Um, sentiment analysis about whether it's pre or, um, or post sale and comments about the product or the, or the brand, um, you know, using things like NPS and, and, and others to, to measure that CES, um, CSAT, things like that. Uh, measuring becomes really valuable when you do a relative measure over time. And so when you see month over month, year over year, quarter over quarter measurements, it becomes really valuable to see, okay, we are, you know, we dipped last quarter, what's going on, you know, some, something must be happening. By the same token, um, while it's, it's good to be able to see that dip, it's not necessarily going to help you diagnose what the problem is, right? So we can see that there is a problem. We can see that, you know, qualitatively people are less happy or less satisfied than they were, but it becomes a little challenging to, um, you know, determine exactly where in the process that was or what that, what that might have been. And so qualitative is going to work hand in hand with quantitative. And so, I'm sure we've all used quantitative many, many times, and and um, you know, in in our in our work here. But you know, anything that can be objectively measured with you know with numbers, anything that can be easily categorized. So whether that's repeat purchases, complaints, referrals, it's probably the easiest thing to measure. Um, by the same token, because it's so easier easy to measure, there are a lot. There's a lot of quantitative data out there. And so um, it, we become flooded with um, the information from analytics tools, from CRM, from, from other, other platforms that we have there. And so um, we can see what's happening and we can, we can often see what's happening at a very specific time in a very specific place on a platform, so on and so forth. So unlike qualitative, um, it, can be, you know, it can be very diagnostic in nature at the same time we could have a million dashboard. If we have 10 different platforms that we use for 10 different things, we have 10 different you know, sets of measurements that we need to look at. So we kind of have the, the, in a sense, the inverse problem of 
there's so much it's it's hard to be able to see. And so we'll we'll get to this a little bit later as well on um, you know how to how to prioritize uh, measurements as well. So those are the those are the outward facing customer thing. These are us measuring things that the customers are doing, feeling, seeing, so on and so forth. So then we go internal to uh, what I call product measurement. And so this is actually measuring the tools that are used to fulfill customer service. So this would be things like mobile app uptime, uh, e-commerce website, not only funnel drop off, but but performance of the website. So a lot of times your IT team will have an SLA with, uh, you know, web host or, you know, mobile app vendor or things like that in order to control for this. Um, while the SLA is very important to make sure that the, the mobile app is, is up and running, there is certainly a customer experience challenge if that, if that mobile app is 99.999% up, but it have that 0.001% that it's down happens to be during the holiday shopping season, all of a sudden you've got a problem. You've, you've got an SLA that was fulfilled with, you know, from a technology standpoint, but you've got some really unhappy customers because at a critical time in the customer experience, um, you're failing them. And so this is why, again, these, these things are already being measured in, in almost all cases, but are they really being tied with your customer experience measurements? And do they help you diagnose um, what some of the shortcomings with your customer experience might be. Um, and so, you know, those, the answer to those questions becomes, becomes apparent when you do have challenges, when there are dips, and when you start tying all of these things together, it's, you know, this, this product measurement becomes really important. The last category is process measurement. And so I feel like this one gets probably the least, uh, the least notice and, and the least oversight within organizations. Um, while there may be a lot of processes, the measurement of how effective those processes, I don't think they, they get enough attention. And so similar to products, you know, if your website's down, um, again, there's a quantitative measurement for that. It's an internal measurement usually, but there's a quantitative way to, to measure that. If your processes don't work, if it, you know, if it takes three changes of hands in order to solve a customer's problem, who is measuring that and how? You know, there are workflow tools, there are, there are processes to be able to do that, but are you tying that into the customer experience measurement that, that you're using across the organization? Um, you know, you may see that, okay, well, NPS numbers didn't really dip that much. And so, you know, there's, there's not really a problem or um, you may not be able to actually diagnose the points in time where, where some of these things are happening, but when you start looking and when you start looking at all of these things, um, you know, more holistically, then all of a sudden you can start saying, okay, yes, you know, we have the measurements in place, but we haven't made any efforts to really improve our processes in a long time. Um, the same processes that work today, um, you know, probably pre pandemic, your processes were a lot different than they are today. I'll, I'll just go on a limb and say that. And so, um, it doesn't take a pandemic um, to need to necessitate process change and improvement. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of those things where just like you're, you're looking at these other measures, it's important that you look at the, the processes themselves. Um, so just to, just to kind of reiterate here, you know, tying it all together makes, makes it more valuable, but Another critical point here is that you can't measure everything. And so, you know, just as I mentioned, there's a, probably a lot of quantitative data that you have uh, at your disposal, looking at all of it and trying to make, um, make decisions based on that, it, it becomes more and more challenging because you're looking at so many things. There's apples to oranges comparisons when you're looking at qualitative and quantitative. There are probably teams that have access to some of your product measurements. Um, and it's, you have to request it from, you know, from your IT team, for instance, you might have to request certain kinds of information. So it becomes a, a bottleneck and, and things like that. And so um, the important thing to do is to determine what the critical KPIs are for your organization. Again, knowing that there may be a lot of things that are valuable, but only so much can be focused on at one time. 
So I'll pause here. Um, just any uh, any questions or thoughts or, or comments, or I'd love to hear anybody disagree <laughs> with my with my points here. Uh, I've got a question. You know, tying it all together. Um, in the past, I've I've had to create indexes out of just thin air, right? <laughs> so yeah. Pre pre dashboard area, really. So we take mystery shop scores and comment cards, and then you know whatever miscellaneous. Uh, Comes, and then also put in some operational data and we just kind of merged it all together and came up with an index. We'd have to weight some things too, because some things are more important than others. Can you, is that what we're talking here kind of, or? Yeah, yeah. And actually that's, that's a great, that's actually a great segue to, um, I wanted to get to the, to the prioritization, but yeah, I think, I think the idea is definitely to create a, I mean, I, I refer them to them as KPIs, but just, they are kind of roll-ups or indexes of, combinations of, of metrics. And I think that's um, because, yeah, you can't, if you look at 300 different metrics, I'm sure we all have access to those, right? But if you look at 300 of them, some are, some are up, some are down. It's like, it's trying to, it's like trying to follow everything in the stock market all at once, right? So. Yeah, um, Mark, I was, I, and Greg, I, I was curious too about that. I was thinking like, I'm curious to hear the room if anyone has had experience doing like a like a combination score, almost like a customer health score that kind of incorporates multiple. And maybe that's what you mean, Mark, is the index. I'm I'm curious um, if anybody's had experience with that. Yeah, I'd love to hear from others. I, I, I'm a researcher by trade, so I was doing this stuff in the '80s and '90s, and it was kind of even real early stage. <laughs> There was no internet, <laughs> so uh, we had to take everything, kind of give it those weights, and then combine it into scores. And we'd have we'd have a score, and we'd actually acronyms around it, and things like that, like the guest score or things like that. Um, nowadays, there are different KPIs, and it's just like NPS has become the score, right? But it doesn't tell the whole story, and I think it's important to get the whole story in tying it together. That's my point of view. Yeah, and Mark, I'm a very qualitative person, and you know, coming from a creative background, so I I know that one of my weaknesses is the quantitative piece of it and bringing it all together in a way that speaks the language of the people that are stakeholders within the company that are making logistic decisions. So I'm just kind of curious about that kind of stuff. Yeah, whether it works for the operations as well as marketing people. <laughs> yeah, anybody have any? Any thoughts, any experiences doing something like that? This is this is Robert. My previous uh, employer, uh, which was Intel Corporation, we did some index type stuff that's been described. Uh, and it, it's effective, but one of the challenges we really had was getting kind of the executives to truly understand how it was derived. So it was as simple as we tried to make it, it was still they, you know, they they would bungle it up when trying to explain it in an open forum, or and it just it it was a challenge. So currently, we are not doing that where I, I currently am, and we, but we've kind of honed in on, you know, some some key CX related ones, and then link them to the the ones that are strongly correlated on the operations side. So for us in our industry, it's really fill rate and executing on orders and that type of thing. So uh that it's i don't know indexes are certainly valuable but they're they're we found that they're in my past that's they're hard to explain and get others to explain and they're easy for us because we're intimately familiar with them right but for the broader population or employees it feels like you're always kind of remember this is 35 percent this is you know that kind of thing so Robert, this is Brett. Um, I'm a researcher by trade as well, and I agree with you completely because we did um, a lot of indexes and some composite scores, you know, kind of like Mark Mickelson back in the day. And every time that we would build those, it was hard for executives to understand. What we ended up finding is the composite or like a health score, like um, Christine is mentioning, is really the best way because it, you can actually then select those measures that are relevant within each of the different kind of parts of the organization, operations, sales, marketing, executive. And then you get those into an overall dashboard that really allows you to make it easy to explain, but also have it be that everyone sees their measure as part of the overall. So that's what we've done in the past and it's been successful a lot. Good stuff, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wanna share something before we move on?
Um, so to the to the point of of prioritization, so one one thing that's that's helped me, and you know, pr relatively simple tool, but I'm gonna share a spreadsheet here. Hopefully, all of you can see it. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, so what I've done, it's a you know, it's a pretty simple prioritization exercise, but um, zoom in a little bit here. So. Um, Again, to the point of we can't measure everything, and you know, I think I think the index idea, and you know, that, that's that's a that's a really good and, and interesting one. When there are very specific things that you do want to measure, and you have found that are going to get the the executives' ears and 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 be priorities to them, um, <clears throat> I've used this not only for measurement but also for pilot projects for initiatives as well is just a very a very simple ranking score which is you know let's look at you know these are really just labels so i just put some example stuff in here of like okay a goal for us would be to increase mps by 20 percent or in the case of i think this was a bank example so improve online account opens um then look at a few key things so um how many customers are affected by this what is the importance to the organization? And what I mean by that is um, generally a strategic business initiative. So, you know, according to the strategic strategic goals of the organization, how important is this? How important is this to the customer? So how is this going to benefit them, help them do their, what whatever problem that you solve or challenge that you help them overcome as an organization, how helpful is it going to be to them? Um, what this kind of what this one kind of gets around sometimes is if there's something that only helps internal teams um, make their lives a little bit easier, while that's certainly valuable, and, and the, like I said, the employee experience is, is valuable, um, if it's not also directly beneficial to the customer, it, it kind of helps weigh that um, a little differently. And then finally, the what is the difficulty to implement or the cost to measure, right? So some things may be incredibly helpful to have, but I often actually split this out into two different columns um, just to, because sometimes those, those numbers are vastly different. But, um, you know, if, if the CEO is really important, you know, the increasing NPS is really important to them, but Maybe cost to measure isn't um, isn't as uh, you know as difficult, but the difficulty to implement for one reason or another is is really high. Then all of a sudden it helps us kind of weigh weigh priorities. And so you know very simple you know very simple algorithm here. If it's even if that could even be considered an algorithm, but it, it does help us try to see um, you know rank comparison from one thing to another. Has anybody used something like this before to um, to to try to uh, prioritize things. Hey, Greg, David Shaw here with Sage. How you doing? We we use something very similar. Um, we look at uh, five impacts to the customer, so we grade each of those. So we talk about does it give them peace of mind? Are we there for them when they need us? Does it give them control? Is it smart and efficient for them? And is it an enjoyable experience for them? So we we average those together as kind of the customer piece of the score. And then internally, we look at what's the order of magnitude. So how many customers is it impacting? We look to see, do is it validated in our survey and our VOC data? So do we also see it there? Um, is it validated with customers? So are, are we actually interviewing and talking to customers in some of our sessions with them and hearing the same thing and then we look at our uh, impact on revenue and the direct impact on our cost. And so when we look at each of those, we score each of those, those get calculated together. And we've got a little, uh, little logarithm we run on it, right? And it comes out to a score between zero and 100. The higher the score, the more critical the issue, the lower the score, the less critical, right? It might just be a point of interest. But that way we're measuring it not only on the customer's weight, but also on our internal weight as well. That's great. No, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Any anybody else do something similar to this? Well, yeah. Um, you know, I definitely I strongly recommend it. I'm actually I'm working with a 
healthcare client right now and using the same model for initiatives. So they've got about a hundred, uh, they're a global company. They've got about a hundred different initiatives that they would like to do within the next 12 months or so, but you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be able to do everything. Uh, probably not everything even within the whole year, but they certainly can't start everything all at once. And so, you know, ranking, ranking these things really helps us. It also, you know, it's, it's a way to communicate that, um, to, you know, to stakeholders and to executives that, you know, there, there do need to be some priorities and it helps, helps, um, not only get buy-in for what, what things are prioritized, but it helps everybody kind of understand that, um, you know, that we need to focus and, and, and focus on those things that are, that are really most important. So, so yeah, ho hopefully that was, that was helpful to, to look through. Um, so now I want to talk about to, to the point of, of we can't do everything uh, everything at once, right? And and more more to the point of of prioritization. Do you want to talk a little bit about the the agile approach? And so um, you know, I'm certainly a fan of agile approaches. I don't think that every organization needs to have be run by certified scrum masters and, and so on and so forth. I think there's um, there's certainly what I would call the religious agile agile folks, and then there are people more like myself that just see the benefits of being, having an agile mindset and and some of the things that it can bring, whether it's always formally adopted or not. And so, just really quickly, um, most of you probably have some familiarity with it, but really, um, you know, agile. I think it's probably easiest to talk about um, what came before it, just as a brief example. So, you know, before there were more agile processes. We had what we call the, the waterfall method, which is we build a lot of requirements up at the up at the top here, and we think we know what's what the world is going to be like when we actually get finished with this. And so, you know, I think we've all lived through um, an example of well, you know, if we were planning something 36 months ago, what might have happened in the world that causes things to be a little bit different if that if that project was supposed to launch you know just just today so um there are certainly some flaws in this process um that said there are a lot of good reasons to use it particularly for short-term projects there are some good reasons to use it even for longer ones it's not that it's um completely unusable or, or not worth considering but there's a lot of flaws in um again, in making such broad assumptions that are very difficult to modify when you're, when you're starting a big initiative. And so, uh, you know, the, the counter to work um, to that is doing things in a lot more iterative processes. So, um, you know, having goals, the goals are still really the same on this version versus the previous slide that I was on, but how we get there is very different and it's informed by not only what's going on in the world, but by our customers, by customer feedback is a key part of this. You know, if we were to plan, just going back to the previous slide, if we were to plan what our customers want at this stage, again, let's say this is a two year project, even a one year project, what are our customers going to see? What competitors are gonna pop up? What technology changes or other, other external events are gonna happen? all the way throughout this process and all of a sudden we launch and the world is different. So Agile helps us do that. And, you know, Agile helps us plan it. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that I see from detractors um, of even approaching things in an Agile way is that it's often perceived, perceived as being reactive to things. And so, okay, we, a lot of us, Anyone familiar with startups knows the term pivot, you know, and it's it it feels um, it feels like changing your mind, like ha like you were all of a sudden you were starting down a path and then you change your mind and do something else. And uh, I think there's a lot of startups that probably do that, and some of them do well and some of them don't. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being reactive to things and changing our minds. I'm what I, what I mean when I talk about agile is actually being scientific about our approaches. So, um, you know, similar enough to the scientific method of let's create a hypothesis, let's perform a test. That test lasts, you know, one to four weeks, usually two or four week sprints here. Let's perform that test, see how it did, and then inform what we do next on that. 
you know, so we're, we're not just looking at results from yesterday and saying, oh my God, we got to change everything. We're actually letting an experiment run, um, performing an actual experiment that is testable and, and repeatable, and then making substantive changes based on that. Or if everything's going well, knowing that we are doing well and that we should proceed as, as we were. So that's what I mean by, you know, by, by agile. And I think, you know, those that, that really subscribe to that, again, whether they're agile as in the organization they work for is a formal agile organization or not, approaching things in this way becomes incredibly helpful. Um, and it does inform the way that we measure things and the, the frequency that we look at, at results and, and just how even we, we perform tests of, of those measurements. I'll just I'll pause there real quick. Um, any anyone in this you know in this uh, this workshop is your organization does it does it use agile processes? Do teams within you know any any experiences there that, that you'd like to share? Anyone may be um, going to be adopting more agile processes. Um, our, unfortunately, our organization learned agile practices prior to um, customer experience. And so they actually have ARTS, which are agile release trains um, that are um, consist of product teams, and development teams, um, which for some reason takes more of a priority than CX, oddly enough. So our team does have uh, a practice agile. Um, to what um, efficiency? I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, what's what? What is? Um, what are some of the challenges that you have with it? Um, so our our organization is pretty complex. I'm I'm at a bank, um, and they're probably at this point they just acquired um, People's United Bank. The reason why I say that is they're at this point I think they're the top ten bank in the U.S. Um, and so you know, they're still learning customer experience. And I think because they both were um, uh, I guess introduced to the organization around the same time, there's confusion around CX and agile and that they're two different things, um, um, oddly enough. Yeah, and also I think with the way the organization is structured, um, they have, because they introduced like a center of excellence with agile, it takes precedence, which means that they're making decisions as opposed to the journey, um, making decisions for um, what we release for solutions and products. Um, I think another um, challenge is the way they structured those release trains. So some of them are embedded while all others are um, not embedded, which means that the teams that are reliant on those arts um, are competing for their backlog. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's kind of a multifaceted, um, complex situation. Yeah, syncing up agile sprints is a is a common challenge. Even even if there's teams that are doing, you know, they're they're all doing agile, but they're doing it a little bit differently, and they're on, you know, they're they're yes. on staggered. Very I'm staggered. actually I'm working with a. Fortune 50 right now that is staggered, but they're doing it in a good way where one actually supports the other as opposed to they used to be completely disconnected and, and disjointed. But yeah, it's um so that yeah, that's that's interesting that you know, because they were, you know, CX and Agile were kind of introduced at the same time. I, I haven't heard that one. That's 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 interesting. Um, but yeah, it's um, I mean, you know, Agile definitely core principle is that, you know, customer feedback is, is important, but I think, yeah, th there might be some mixed messages there as far as, um, you know, how, how they're getting that customer feedback and stuff. So, yeah, no, thank Thanks so much for sharing. Sorry. Sorry that you're, uh, you're dealing with some of that, <laughs> that right now, but hopefully, hopefully it can get worked out. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah no, thanks. Anybody else have a, um, anything related to, to agile to share? Uh, I'll move on here. So um, next thing I want to talk about related to, you know, we're talking about measurement, but we're also talking about communicating that 
that business value. And um, Christine, you actually touched on, on one of these things. I'll, I'll get to that in a second um, as, as a nice segue here. So, um, you know, methods to gain buy-in. And I think um, the, the, the anecdote that Christine just shared is that, you know, it's actually pretty interesting that there are always going to be competing priorities within any organization. You know, we're competing for funds, we're creating for, um, you know, talent, we're creating, you know, competing for all, all manner of things. Um, sometimes even just attention of executives to, you know, to help us get things done. Um, but, um, you know, it's certainly um, understanding that you need to get buy-in, I think, I guess, is, that's, that's, that's the ground floor here, is it is vital that you do get that buy-in. And so, you know, that's, that's really stage one, and maybe it, it even, um, it, it deserves its own slide here, but I'll just kind of, kind of underscore it as making sure that you have executive or at the very least, you know, senior stakeholder buy-in in customer experience is critical. And so, you know, a lot of you, again, you're on a CX team already. So there's obviously, uh, you know, a senior leader and an executive um, buy-in on customer experience in general. What I've seen is often the case though, is, you know, sometimes that's not enough to simply have, uh, you know, a CXO or a CX team because where effort and dollars and resources get applied, um, there's the, it still has to be prioritized. You know, just having, having um, you know, having someone with a title, certainly it requires a lot more than that. It's certainly a step in a, a great step in the, in the right direction, but, those those leaders, those CX leaders need the authority and the funds and the resources to be able to do that. So that's you know executive buy-in. That is that is stage one. Um, beyond that, you know my recommendation when you are doing something new. Again, most of you are not starting CX from scratch, but when you're doing something new, if it's a new pilot project, if it's a new initiative, if it's finding better ways to measure start small and iterate this, you know this goes back to the the agile conversation a little bit as well but um you know as grand as your vision is for the future and and what cx could do for the organization um you're not going to get there unless you can um you know unless you can get there iteratively and importantly show quick wins so measurement certainly comes into play here but um, you know, showing quick win, you know, let's again, we're talking, we look at it from an agile standpoint, talking two week sprints, accomplishing things, and within a matter of weeks or months, you're able to show some progress and moving the needle on something. And then you go back to your executive sponsor and say, this is what we did with minimal, minimal budget and resources. Imagine what we could do with even more. Along those lines, um, you know, don't work in a silo. Even if you have, if even if you're on a CX team, you know that you know CX, you know, requires a lot of different functions, a lot of different practice areas. So, make sure that you're building those bridges. And um, you know, one effective way that I've seen is even if there is a CX department, build steering committees, build working groups that have somebody from IT, somebody from marketing, somebody you know, from, from various parts of customer service, different areas of the organization that are talking together, meeting on a regular basis, building relationships. You know, if you're in a small organization, you may uh, maybe not these days bump into each other physically, but you may, you know, may be in meetings together. But if you're in a large organization, chances are you have no reason to talk with people on a regular basis that are in completely other teams and departments and even geographies find ways to build bridges and build these working groups because it's going to pay off in the long run. Not only are you going to learn what some of their challenges are, but you're going to build relationships with these different teams where, uh, you know, even to go back to the example of the measurements, if you, if product measurements are important and part of whether it's an index that you create or, or some KPI that, that is valuable, if you have someone from the data group within your organization on your steering committee, it is going to be very easy to ask them, hey, I need this set of data and I need it monthly. Can you get that for me? As opposed to trying to figure out, again, in a large organization, 
it can be cumbersome to figure out who the right person is and and ask them for favors as opposed to having them be part of a team that that works regularly on these these issues um anybody i'm just out of curiosity does anybody have a something like that like a steering committee or a working group or, or something like that you know not a department per se but um uh maybe a less formal but still you know cross cross disciplinary group Any, anybody have one in their organization and, and want to share Greg, this is Brett. Um, I, I don't have one now, but at a previous um, company uh, in healthcare, we actually had one very similar to that where we'd have a monthly um, committee that got together that was pretty much the VP of each of the different departments across, and they would look at new product releases, they would look at impacts on CX, they'd look at voice of the customer, and they bring all that information together to really kind of kind of triangulate. Um, are they working on the right things? Are the new products, features, releases um, delivering on the things that were most important to customers? And it was probably one of the most valuable meetings that happened um, each month. For the organization wow that's, kept everybody informed yeah it was great that's great yeah that's that was because my follow-up was going to be how did it work so that's no that's that's wonderful to hear yeah i mean i've i've heard i've worked with a few orgs that that have done that and even helped a few set them up in the first place but yeah in my experience too it's it's always been valuable you know from a number of different different dimensions so that, that, that's great to hear thanks for sharing anybody else yeah so greg um we have you can call them steering committees we call them something else in this uh, but uh i'm not in the digital world per se we offer services to you know large telcos around the world <clears throat> um but we've had multi-layer steering committees if you want to call them that here I find that the higher the level, higher up the steering committee goes, the less impact it has on customer experience. So those who are in the you know, mid-level manager and down that can actually impact the, make the changes happen, have a bigger impact than the steering committees at the top that are, you know, VP. So uh, that's been my experience. Great. Yeah. No. Thanks for thanks for sharing. Yeah. yeah so, so maybe in that case, the more the doers versus the the, the managers. Yeah. Doers. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, and then you know the the kind of the next level of that um, you know is is the the center of excellence model. And so you know I I wrote a book called Center of Experience that is really outlines um, one way at least to, to create a center of excellence within an organization and, and just some, some ways to look at categorization of, of those things. That is certainly a bigger effort to undertake. Um, any of you that have been part of or helped set up a, a center of excellence, whatever the, whatever the subject matter was, um, you know, it takes a lot of effort to, um, to do that certainly, but once it's in place, you know, can really, um, even if there's a CX department or division or, or something like that already, you know, it's still, as you can see, there's a lot of things that um, are are part of the customer experience, and even you know, even the HR and the the employee experience component is can become vital here as well. So, you know, I strongly recommend that um, you know, if if the organization, is, I would say these are the on that maturity scale, these are the fours and the fives that are. That are setting things like this up, because um, I think you know at a um, before that the steering committees and working groups work work very well. Sometimes even with much more mature organizations, they work well as well. But um, you know another another option to consider. And then um, you know a, another thing that I've found helpful. Uh, again, we're talking about getting buy-in and. Um, from from execs and in order to get more investments, you know, we talked about this a bit already as far as whether it's creating indexes or rolling up numbers or even just prioritizing using the model that I showed, but um, creating some kind of roll up or dashboard that allows measurements over time 
um, successes throughout the journey. So we're not just looking at one point in the journey. Um, also, sometimes dashboards can highlight where investments need to be made. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to show failure um, often to our executives, but by highlighting challenge points, we can often um, influence investment and, and priority and, and things like that. So, you know, being able to look at the, the journey holistically, make sure that the KPIs are tied to business, you know, strategic business objectives. Uh, I'm of the opinion, I'm sure many of you are as well, that CX should always be a strategic business objective, but again, how tangibly and how directly investments are made in CX is, is sometimes a different, um, a different story. Um, and then, you know, kind of to, to double down on the, the point I was just making as well is, you know, create a dashboard that, that provides recommendations on tangible actions and improvements that can be made. Again, it's not just to show that we're doing a good job, it's also to show that we need further investment in this. When we look at the, um, that maturity scale and the, the, the number of companies that are fours and fives, again, if you're not in that top realm already, you're falling behind. And those, those fours and fives are mature and they're, they're, they're accelerating because they have a lot of processes and things in place. So the gap between the, you know, the twos and the fours or the threes and the fives is going to continue to increase unless investments and prioritizations are made. So you know, having, a, having a way to visualize that, to show it over time, to be able to highlight where investments need to be made, you know, all, all, all important stuff. Um, so I um, wanted to pause here at the end to just um, get get some, uh, you know, if, if we have any questions, uh, it, that's everything that I, I was hoping to go through. I think we got we got through uh, things in a, in a good amount of time here. So, um, and I really appreciate everybody's, uh, everybody's feedback and, and jumping in there. So, you know, I'll just, uh, I'd, I'd love to just kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, any, any other, any other questions or, or things that we could, um, we could answer here while we're all, we're all, all together. You know, uh, Greg, I, I was kind of, you know, all these metrics, everyone's kind of hooked on, and we talk about it a lot in different small groups, particularly MPS and, you know, how much emphasis is given once someone's bonus is tied to that, so to say. Um, and, and we've seen that happen throughout, systemically throughout the ages. Anytime you tie a bonus or something, it gets done and then abused. <laughs> And I'm just wondering if, if anyone here has, has thought about or has even seen um, maybe Fred Reichel's new thing that he's doing, where he's basically trying to say, look, how'd you get here instead of who would you recommend? <laughs> um, and then, you know, attribution, a marketing attribution, right? You start giving attribution points to things. And I'm wondering if that might apply any to these metrics. Like, do you have any thoughts or anyone have any thoughts on what NPS is doing for your company or your clients? I mean, I'll, I'll just kind of jump in really quick on yeah. the, the, the measurement throughout the journey. I mean, I, I think that really is the key part is that, you know, lagging indicators are useful and, and very helpful as relative measures over time, but getting real time insights, even getting those quantitative measures over time really help us diagnose what is happening, where we're, where we're falling, where things are falling through the cracks. I mean, I think that is the flaw with solely relying on NPS. Again, NPS is, is fine, CSAT, CS, like all those, I think they're they're good things. And especially when they've been used for a decade or more, I think they're incredibly valuable to have that relative, um, you know, on the employee side, I think employee engagement scores are incredibly helpful as well, but they don't tell you exactly what happened last month with your employees. So similar with customers, it's like, um, I think we need, better, more accurate, and more specific measures that help us understand what our NPS is trying to tell us. And so I'll, I'll just pause there. Yeah, I mean, even the, even the, the qualitative stuff, and we all have to have qual around to understand why the NPS, right? Um, and doing that at scale has been a challenge, especially at scale, and then going in and quantifying those comments and things. And, and I'm kind of wondering, that's where the meat seems to be, you know? 
uh, how do I how do I do better? You know, how can I get there? And then understanding how do I quantify those at scale, real time, to get them out. If that's an actionable format, digestible, let's say, format, <laughs> not actionable, just digestible. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> well, we'll have plenty of time to talk tomorrow. But <laughs> so, Mark, I'll I'll chime in on that a little bit. Yeah. If mind. So I, I think you're right. It is a challenge to the scale, and for our organization, where we get thousands and thousands of piece of feedback every day, right? Um, we have a global experience team who manages best practice, but we enable our regional CX teams to kind of run their local programs the way they want. And I think one of the, the best examples I've seen of scaling that has been in South Africa and here in North America, where instead of having a small dedicated team of CX professionals that go through all the the CSAT and NPS and all of the survey feedback, they enlist the help of the organization. They basically say, look, it's everybody's data. So we're gonna open it up to everybody. We're gonna teach you how to read the data and we're gonna give you a platform that you can reach out to customers. Um, but you know, here in North America, they've got about 350 colleagues from every walk of life here at Sage, from finance to legal to development, UX, sales, operations, you name it. And every day these people are picking up the phone, going through the list of people who have submitted surveys that day and calling the customers back, right? If, if their survey mentions something around operations or having a problem with the process, then one of those operations people pick that up and they, they call the customer and they just you know, have a conversation with them, talk to them a little bit about the feedback that they gave and, and why they gave it. So I think when you talk about scale, right, I think mm -hmm. that's been one of our keys is rather than have a small team of four people go through it all and then try to translate it to everybody else, let everybody else come in, let them go through it, let them capture the feedback. Um, of course, we run text and sentiment analysis on, on what they capture, but it's really just getting all these folks who normally wouldn't be talking to customers, but are developing things that impact the customer, get them talking to customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other thoughts? I see it. There's a couple of questions here as well. I'll, I can I can answer those and would love to discuss those. Yeah, take them. Yeah. So Mark asked a couple of questions actually. So um, you know, first, uh, just to kind of describe the center of excellence a little bit more, and you know, you you bring up a great point, Mark, which is. You know, shouldn't the entire company be a CX center of excellence? To which I say yes, <laughs> but um, as is often the case, I mean, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of uh, a lot of priorities within an organization. And so I think the way the way to think of it as you know, ideally speaking, you have the kind of organization where customer centric culture is you know it's just part of you show up for work the first day and it's part of the DNA and that's just you know how how the job is done. For those organizations that aren't quite there, um, or even those that are, there needs to be a group that is looking at customer experience from a lot of different angles. And think of it as a as governance over customer experience um, from a number of different aspects. So the and there's a subtle difference between a CX department and a, a CX center of excellence because a CX department is going to have certain things that they're that they're in charge of or that they have purview over, but they don't, they're not directly responsible for, let's say for data or for brand language or, um, or you know, for even for how employees are onboarded or, or things like that from an HR perspective. And so the center of excellence really is, is the group that they don't do the work necessarily, but they they determine how the work should be done and then disseminate those um, that throughout the organization. So that's that's one way to look at it. Um, does that help um, or any any questions based on that or does anybody, you know, anybody disagree with that? And then um, the, the second question is just, you know, what's a reasonable number of KPIs before it gets too many? I, th I think that's a great question. And, you know, as a classic consultant answer, I will always say it depends. But um, you know, I would say you know, a, 
pick a handful um, and you know maybe three or four that that are that are very meaningful particularly if you're if you're getting started uh, you know or relatively immature in, in CX you know pick pick three or four that are directly related as, as close as you can to other business objectives so if you can draw that line between you know between you know KPI one and a business level KPI, um, that's that's part of the strategic objectives. Then you're going to be a lot better shape than to have ten different measures that, um, and some of which are you know uh, the CEO or, or executive team looks at that and are like, oh well, that sounds nice for the CX team, but how do I map that to the bottom line? I think that becomes a lot more challenging. So you know, I would pick really just a few and um, and and make them meaningful and reinforce them. I think I think that's the other key thing is continue to show those metrics and continue to show the relative you know losses gains in those and they will be drilled into the executives and, and the teams that yes these are important things and when this number goes up we're, we're doing well and, and so on and so forth anybody anybody have any other thoughts or with with that question as well Anything else? Well, I guess that's, uh, that's, I think, I think everyone's full. <laughs> <laughs> well, great job, Greg. Uh, you know, it's, it's always tough when you're, when you're that good, no one has answers or questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> that must be what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's what it is. It's, it is. Uh, yeah, it happens uh, on stage as well. Not just, not just in Zoom meetings. Um, but I, I do a really, I think this has been great. I want to give everyone just a chance to take a little bit of a break here. Um, also, before we have our networking session, which is going to be on this same bat channel. Um, so come back at around 430 or so. Just go ahead and grab you, do what you need to do. And, and we'll come back here at about 430. See who's here and we'll network with them. And then um, then we'll be wrapped up by 530 at the latest. OK. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm going to turn off the recording.